Now I want to introduce Mike Kirst. Um, and uh, all of you know Mike as the uh, president of the State Board of Education. Most of you know that Mike was president of, board of, president of the Board of Education under the, the first Brown government back in the 1970s. Um, and uh, many of you know that Mike is a professor emeritus of education and business at Stanford. Uh, but we think of Mike as the founder of PACE. And uh, I am very happy to welcome him to the podium. Jim Guthrie and I founded PACE in 1983. And uh, I'm delighted that, you know, after all those years, uh, here we are uh, still looking at, uh, uh, at uh, the uh, PACE and how vibrant it is and how important it is in the state's uh, policy pantheon. So I'm uh, happy to, uh, to be the keynote here this morning. And uh, so I'm going to talk about what I think we've accomplished in uh, some ways the framework or theory of action that we're uh, pursuing at the state level and then uh, talk throughout about, you know, the glass is half full but it's half empty and look at some of the parts of it that are half empty. So uh, let me start off by saying this uh, period when uh, I, I came in with uh, Jerry Brown again, um, I'm in my fourth term as president of the State Board of Education, and the first and fourth terms are separated by 40 years. So uh, it's, uh, I remember the old days pretty well with Bill Honig and so on. So um, as we come back, it, 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 we've confronted a really good, what John Kingdon calls, policy window opening. When does a policy window open and, and you can do a lot of big things? And according to Kingdon's theory, which I think has a lot of merit, you have three basic, basic vector forces that come together. You have a united political coalition that stays together over a long period of time. We'll have basically eight years of the same uh, political coalition of education and outside of education and basically some of the same players for eight years. So you keep a, a political coalition. Second vector force is you have a rising tide of revenue. And after the initial years, we've had a quick rising tide of revenue. Uh, and so that's the second. And third, uh, you have some big ideas and you have them organized in a way, as I'll stress today, that makes them coherent and aligned and fit together in a way uh, that can cause policy change. So if you uh, look at then uh, what we have tried to do, uh, we have also uh, had the mantra of pers the per persistence, patience, and humility. So we're going to stay with this, we're gonna be persistent, we're going to counsel patients. It's going to take a long time to do what we're trying to do. Uh, and then humility. We're trying things, and we don't know how they're really going to work out. And so we need to back that up with the mantra of continuous improvement, that as we discover things, we move to correct things uh, as quickly as we can. So we look forward to the uh, an academic and policy analysis and uh, practitioner community to give us that feedback. So uh, let me give you an overview, and this is my uh, single slide, but there's a tons on it. Um, essentially, the approach of the state of California to me is what's uh, something I learned from a group called the Consortium for Policy Research in Education, CEPRI, which was five universities in the 1990s and 2000. And it's a theory that Mike Smith, who isn't here today, and Jennifer O'Day did, which is called systemic state policy reform. Uh, and systemic state policy stresses that you have to look at all of your policies and make them and, uh, that are needed to bring about what you want. Uh, and then you have to have them aligned, coherent, and, and, and in depth. Uh, and so what do we want? Well, to oversimplify it somewhat, uh, I th what we're about to me is improving classroom instruction uh, in the four major subjects and more as we add them. 
Uh, what I've learned over the years is if you're not changing and improving classroom instruction, you're working basically at the overhead level. You can fool around with governance and finance and so on, but if it doesn't filter down uh, to uh, teaching and learning, then you're really not having much traction. So uh, we, uh, if I start with our four subject areas, we have revamped all of these with new curriculum, new standards, English language arts and mathematics, next generation science, and history social studies, which we just accomplished. So if you take those four and you say, how are you going to improve instruction through state policy? Then to me, you want a lot of policy that's coherent, integrated, and as I take uh, the top, you want to look, and we'll look today, at, uh, pay attention to your policy gaps. There are some where you have nothing. Uh, look at policy conflicts where one policy is saying do this and the other saying do something else. And look at your depth of implementation in the policies uh, because that's really uh, where it is. And we have somewhere between 300 and 325,000 teachers and you know how how deep can you are you going in this, and how strong is the bite that you have? So let me start then with this a focus at the top of the wheel there, and so all of these slices, if you will, feed in uh, hopefully in a coherent way into your uh, uh, succeeding with classroom instruction in English in your four subjects. So curriculum, I've already talked about the overhaul of them. I mean, this is really substantial uh, overhaul when you look at it. Uh, the next generation science standards is very different from our science standards. Uh, you know about the common core. So we have done a job on the content and the standards. Uh, then you want to make your materials coherent with your uh, curriculum content and standards. Uh, and we have revamped the materials and um, through the Instructional Quality Commission, uh, uh, recommended the locals use certain materials, but increasingly they're using, since we, one of the early things we did in 211 with the legislature was to deregulate uh, the state role in materials where you no longer, we don't, we, even though we adopt them, or they're not required to use them through of tying money to them. So, we, you know, there's a lot more local choice uh, and, um, uh, engage New York, which we didn't have time to put on the, uh, the curriculum for uh, mathematics, uh, is being adopted by large numbers of locals under their local authority. Uh, so uh, the materials are also uh, aligned in that sense, and can be all of this can be improved, but at least they're on the same page. When I came into the California Department of Education in 1975, there was a division that did assessment here, and they didn't talk to the curriculum division. So, you know, it was, it was you know, just getting that right. Digital, uh, we're going to have to use much more technology in teaching. When we started in 211, the average school in California had the bandwidth of the average family in California nowhere near and we were able to install huge amounts of bandwidth compared to what we had and I remember when we were doing smarter balanced assessment when we were down to near the end and we were trying to get bandwidth into Death Valley California which is below sea level and there was you know there were several you know districts that were left so the idea that we got bandwidth in there to run the smarter balance test is quite a um, an achievement when you look where we started from. Of course, more needs to be done uh, to have the, the availability of computers in classrooms that teachers need to uh, assist them. So uh, that's a brief overview on some of that. And then second part, of course, is your human resources and capacity. And this is where we're really, um, uh, you know, this is what keeps me up at night the most. Um, the, uh, we have the pre-service education. If all these teachers are to teach a new curriculum, obviously we need pre-service education that's changed. That has been spreading, still more to do there, but uh, important. Uh, but also a problem we didn't see coming, frankly, in 211 is the teacher shortage. Uh, as uh, we did, we, we had ample supply as we entered 211, we were still laying people off uh, in that regard. 
So in, uh, in that era, uh, back in, in uh, the middle 2000s, we had about 70,000 teachers in training in California, uh, and that dropped to 22,000 by 2016. So uh, there, there is a, po a policy gap that we're uh, attempting to fill, but I think that's a really important issue for you all to work in the future uh, in that regard. So, but I think there are changes in pre-service education. Uh, In-service, professional development, professional learning, whatever you um, want to talk about there. Uh, we had a West Ed survey uh, that said the administrators thought it was going pretty well, uh, and the teachers said for Common Core, uh, they liked what they were getting, but they weren't getting nearly enough. So there was this surprising disconnect between the administrators and the teachers. I side with the teachers. Uh, one thing I probably won't have time to talk about uh, is that we are uh, working on, and uh, this is a political uh, issue as well, on using the new ESSA law to build capacity uh, and to deal with this uh, professional development the classroom area. If the state took all the withholds and withheld the money in the ESSA, it's about $150 million. You know, 7% of this and 4% of that, which can be withheld at the state level. So we, there's a policy paper that's public talking about state withholding uh, and then building capacity uh, for professional development through that state withholding. Uh, the state has to regrant most of the money to local school districts, but you can run competitions. You could give the money to a county office as a fiscal agent, run some other programs. There is $7 million in set aside in Title II you could withhold that to recreate a principal and, and uh, school leaders program, uh, such as we had when Bill was superintendent, not the same, but in, in, the, in the theory of, of, of that. So there are a lot of possibilities in ESSA. Uh, moreover, with ESSA, all of our applications are defunct. They were done for NCLB. So we're, how, what, are the, uh, what, what are the new applications? Remember, Title I is a bank account for local districts, they don't get it unless the state approves their application. So we're looking at redoing the applications. I can't, uh, no time here to go into all this, but uh, really, so I'm hoping that the professional development area would, would, work, would be uh, uh, an area that we would have more uh, depth on. But we did address it in the systemic way, uh, not deep enough, not enough, but at least we're aware of it and we have been doing many things through counties and other areas and our foundations that are in the audience have helped a lot about, uh, in that. Teacher evaluation, now there is a policy gap. Uh, so, you know, sometimes you do have no policy. Uh, so, uh, yes, we have the Stull Act, but uh, it's, not, um, it's not clear to me that people are implementing that. Uh, and I talked to a teacher just uh, two weeks ago in a large urban district, and uh, that teacher hadn't, he's a 16-year veteran, hadn't been evaluated in five years, would like to be evaluated, uh, but nothing going on, even though the Stull Act says you should have annual evaluation. So uh, now with the Obama administration out of office, I think we need to, uh, and one of the things for you all to discuss is what do we do about teacher evaluation? I don't think we're gonna come on uh, with some state plan. Arnie Duncan told me uh, uh, for you to get a waiver, uh, you've got to have a state-specified teacher policy in 11,150 California schools by 215. And I said, that's sort of crazy. We're in the middle of a transition to Common Core. I, you know, it just doesn't make any sense. So what to do now? Uh, I think we've learned a lot on teacher evaluation, but that is a policy gap. Now on the state assessments, uh, they are aligned with our curriculum and, and, uh, and, and professional development. As you know, we're the stalwart of Smarter Balance. Uh, we've cut assessments uh, since 211 by 50%. Uh, uh, remember, we used to assess a lot of senior high subjects, world history, U.S. history, and so on, and all of that has gone. Uh, and the Smarter Balanced Assessment is computer adaptive. Uh, it is, uh, requires extended responses, where you may have to defend your answer, and it has a performance exam. Uh, and so it is, I think, a state-of-the-art exam, and we worked back 
from what you need to do to be ready for college and careers uh, in both Common Core and our other curricula changes to what is the implication of that for what you need to be teaching and assessing in K-12. So the assessment is new. Uh, I would like to fill in grades 9 and 10, uh, which uh, I think uh, that would be my personal priority uh, in that regard, because the gap between 8 and 11, which comes from NCLB, why would you do that to me? Uh, you know, somehow it's an NCLB, and we're st so that's a gap to me for further discussion. Uh, and, and then we're doing a new uh, English learner assessment call, called LPAC. That, uh, we've been using the CELT as a, both a, uh, a diagnostic and a summative exam, so uh, that, uh, that I think is another uh, area we're doing with the next generation science standards assessment we're piloting. Uh, and so we're doing a lot on new assessments. So continuing around now, uh, I will continue around counterclockwise to special education. Uh, uh, we, uh, through some foundation funding, we created a statewide task force which calls for a large overhaul of the um, uh, special education program, making it much more all one system. California has uh, way above the national average in segregated classes where students are not uh, in, in, a, in, in a mainstream class. Uh, our identification policies are all over the map. Uh, and so we are um, uh, uh, moving forward there and, and have had some budget initiatives and, and momentum in special education. To do on the to-do list was is when we did the uh, school finance formula, local control funding formula, uh, passed on special education. That's been on my to-do list. Uh, and PPIC has come out with a recent report doing a major overhaul uh, calling of special education. Uh, this program uh, of finance goes back to the early 1990s with some parts of it that go back to my era in 1978. So it is essentially in the same shape that California general finance was in. Uh, PPIC outlines some specific uh, uh, areas of, of funding, uh, change that need to be done, uh, and uh, the governor in his budget called for an intensive process uh, this spring uh, to come up with a specific proposal for special education finance, uh, which hopefully we'll be able to do something about in 218. So that has an area of, uh, uh, and that special ed finance then would reinforce the one system and reinforce the ties to the curriculum areas uh, that these pupils must be expected to meet in special ed. In finance, uh, we, you know, I'm not gonna talk about the local control funding formula. I, I, it has been 90, over 94, about 94% funded uh, in the first uh, five years of it. The, the, if you take school districts like, say, Alum Rock in East San Jose, which is almost all low income, happens to be oh, mostly all uh, English learners, their per pupil uh, allocation is up 50% from 211, 50%. And I go around to these local, the, the, the districts that are highly concentrated and they all tell me <laughs> about 50%. 50% is real money per pupil. And so I would you know, say we've done a lot. Uh, on that, however, uh, when Goodwin Liu and I uh, were, and uh, Alan Burson worked on this, uh, the assumption we had was not that we're doing adequacy. Uh, the state will every year allocate some money to local school districts. <laughs> That's going to happen. Our job at that point was to make what we, whatever we appropriated and sent to local school districts better, uh, free it up from the categoricals because the categoricals were not based on the center of my policy wheel on the curriculum changes. Uh, and therefore, we were, do, we were dealing with, with the amount of money, so there was not an adequacy standard. Now that Bill uh, Kosky, my old student, has lost his lawsuit, I can stand up there and say that. So, uh, in, in, in that regard, so that so that's there, and I uh, look forward to uh, what you uh, think about that. Uh, as far as the LCAP, uh, the uh, the LCAP uh, is now with its third iteration of a framework, going back to I'm sorry, with its template that you fill out. Uh, third version, so um, we're practicing continuous improvement there. 
uh, in that regard. And it'll be the first year that it'll be hooked to our dashboard. In the legislation, it's called a rubric, but that, we found that confusing, so we've changed it to dashboards. And so the dashboard, new dashboard for accountability will be uh, unveiled uh, uh, at the state board meeting in March, early March, and you'll see the whole thing. Uh, not time to talk about that now, but of course the LCAP uh, the template for budget planning uh, needs to uh, be related to the outcomes on the dashboard. We, you know, never had that synergy going, so this is still a very much a work in progress. Moreover, uh, I think that the biggest problem we face with the LCAP to me, and you're going to talk about that this, this afternoon, I see Arun there, and he's certainly an articulate uh, spokesman about this, is that it is dropped into a fundamentally flawed local budgeting and accounting process. Uh, I think the LCAP gets blamed for the under, uh, in many cases, for the underneath problems. Remember how we budget. We budget in huge things, instruction, facilities, uh, uh, fringe benefits. You can't find programmatic interventions in our budgeting system in these huge categories. This is the same system I looked at when I started in this business in 1964. And then so the back end accounting, you don't know whether the things you put in the LCAP, whether you even spent the money because uh, it's hard to track the spending. Sometimes the districts couldn't hire the people. Uh, so it, it, the accounting system as well, it, it, it's, to me, it, we, we need to step back, and I know this is uh, not a thing a lot of academics often deal with, but I think the whole underneath budgeting system needs a further, and the categories of it needs a really deep look and overhaul. Uh, English learners. Uh, we made a major, I think, breakthrough in merging the English language uh, curriculum co uh, content standards with the English, English language arts before they were separated. And the English language uh, learner standards weren't really standards, they were a mixture of how to do things and some standards and they weren't really integrated. So it's fully integrated. Uh, we now have a scaffolding of how you work through English learners to the Common Core English Language Arts. Uh, you know, that's a big challenge to teach, going back to the, the depth. Remember, one of the things I have is lack of depth in the policy, so we're, we're challenged there. We're gonna come in with a new assessment, which will be so much better, and link to our standards for English Language Arts, no longer the self. Uh, and so we've made, I think, some significant strides there trying to put it in. Career and technical education. Uh, the state has new initiatives in career and technical education that link to the Common Core and, and Next Generation Sciences. About $1.4 billion, uh, $900 million in the Career Pathways Trusts, which are linked courses. Remember, it's college and career ready. So the Career Pathways Trust Program uh, is, is a series of courses in high school that link hope to series of next series of sequencing of courses in community college or post-secondary education, and also has some employer buy-in through uh, internships and so on. So the idea of a curricular pathways uh, through that um, area of career technical education uh, is really, I think, uh, needed to meet the, uh, meet the standards uh, and the college and career readiness area. Uh, and so the, that area, we spent about uh, $500 million on that. And then the older RO of, called regional occupation programs, regional occupation centers, we, we will have spent $950 million uh, revamping those. Uh, and uh, those go back to when I, I remember approving those in 1977-78. We approved the ROP, ROC. Uh, and so these are due for an overhaul and are being overhauled. And then career technical education will decategorize and, and it'll be folded into the formula. The local control formula has uh, a higher weight for, for high school and that is to account for the uh, uh, higher expenditures uh, for career and technical education. 
So I could go on with other things in, in this regard as, as, as uh, before. And we're going to put uh, career and technical education curriculum sequences and so on in our college and career readiness indicator, which is one of the several things on our dashboard. Uh, so, and that is uh, uh, getting more measurements of CTE uh, on that dashboard is, a, is something that we need some help on. College readiness. Uh, one of the things that we have worked on, uh, I have written extensively uh, in, uh, on the gap between high school and college, the, uh, written on the history of the disconnect. I could go on on this for a long time. Uh, but one of the things we have worked on to make the policy system coherent, aligned, is to bring in higher education. So I've just finished, for example, in December, uh, addressing all the faculty senate heads of all of the public institutions in California about our plans and how we can work together. I met with the Un University of California Regents uh, in, in, in that regard, and of course, I'm an old friend of Eloy Oakley, and uh, we're, uh, we have created a new joint board between the Board of Governors of the Community Colleges and the, and the uh, uh, some members of the State Board of Education to coordinate our uh, high school community college things at the board level more explicitly. So that being said, one of the uh, ideas was uh, that if you were to oppose Common Core in California, you would be taking on higher education as well. And we've made a lot of progress on that. Uh, <coughs> The California community uh, colleges and the state, uh, California State University uh, use a smarter balance level three as an indicator as to whether students need remediation or not. Uh, and then, of course, Cal State U has its uh, early write, reading writing program for senior year, and they're developing by legislative specification a math program for 12th grade, which will be a transitional uh, kind of math program to get you ready for college if you're not ready. So we have that. The uh, University of California approves A to G courses using Common Core as one of its key considerations. So we have a significant um, uh, driver there. Uh, the new SAT is aligned uh, better or, uh, and, and, or aligned uh, uh, to, the, to the Common Core, uh, which is uh, the predominant exam we use. Uh, in that regard. So uh, we're, we're getting our signals together. More, more work, uh, I think, needed on how to coordinate those. Um, so, uh, and, and all of our leaders of higher education endorse the Common Core in public statements and so on. Uh, so we have some things going there in, in that regard. One of the things uh, that I pleaded with the Regents about, and will plead with CSU, is to use the uh, Smarter Balance Level 3 as one of the factors in college admission. Uh, and and that, that this would uh, uh, be added to their, they use a comprehensive admission policy. So that would be another policy which we're trying to, which we're pursuing in, in that re uh, regard. Uh, and, and, and hope to move uh, forward in that, in that area. But we can certainly deepen, I find, you know, higher ed faculty not aware of uh, Common Core in, in large part. We have a lot of work to do there. Uh, and I think uh, we'll be doing a lot more coordination work with them. So we've tried to address that and actually, uh, you know, it's, we're, it's a long way to go, but we're still, I think, about the leading state in all these policies that we've been uh, bringing about uh, in, in that regard. Finally, waivers and flexibility. Of course, the uh, local control formula created much more flexibility. Uh, the state board has been uh, very active in approving waivers uh, and, uh, and, and providing uh, those changes, um, more coming in that regard. Uh, and uh, so we're, you know, a, a board which is really trying to look at that. So with a little time left here, um, let me mention then the new policy areas that, uh, that are short-run issues uh, for you to watch and to evaluate if you wish to. Uh, the new elementary and uh, ESSA, the new uh, federal act, uh, we, were go we are trying to, as well as look at the back end of accountability, shift policy to the front end 
so that you prevent low accountability resorts. Uh, so I talked about redoing the applications, uh, using uh, the set-asides in an aggressive way uh, to build teacher capacity uh, and administrator capacity. Uh, uh, and uh, the uh, ESSA merges uh, Title III for English learners into Title I. That's part of one of, of the coherent policies we're doing. We're going to really work on that. Uh, you know, if we will do our ESSA plan in September or approve it in, at the board level in September 2017. So we have some time on this, but I regard ESSA as a really good uh, opportunity to, uh, to seize the mantle. I, I started, I was the second person hired in the Title I office in 1965. So I wrote the, uh, uh, was one of three people that wrote the original regulation. So, uh, you know, and th this is my last shot to get federal aid better. And so I, uh, I'm going to take it. Uh, special ed finance, uh, I've talked about that. Um, it is inequitable. I know you have a concern about equity. It's all over the place uh, on equity. Uh, it is totally tr untransparent. I mean, money goes to these SELPAs, and then, and we have uh, 113 of those critters, I think, called SELPAs. No other state redistributes money for special ed through a SELPA. And it's not, cl and they do different things with the money, and that's probably okay, but I don't know what they're doing uh, when, they, when they get the money, so uh, we're, we're working on that. Accountability implementation. Um, so you'll see the long-awaited dashboard soon. We were going over the prototypes of this yesterday. Uh, so we've done all this policy under the legislative. We met all the legislative deadlines. Our last deadline was September 2016 for policy. And so that'll obviously be rolling out. And that's a major undertaking uh, in that regard. Uh, and then building out our, uh, our local and state data systems uh, obviously, the uh, new dashboard, lots of new data. I mean, we haven't even had a chronic absence indicator. Uh, we haven't had a uniform policy for designation of when you exit English learner programs. Uh, both of those will be implemented in 217. Uh, so those will uh, come along. Other but I, I think uh, a theory of action we've had, which has put us at odds with all these national rankings on data, uh, and I realize we have some data challenges statewide, but we have really been trying to build local data for local use. Uh, and I, uh, I'm told I'm out of time, so no more on that. And so, um, <laughs> and finally, I'll then repeat our major gaps in policy, uh, just for that I see some of them. Uh, preschool, uh, other than transitional kindergarten, that is a political mess. and largely an argument over slots and not over quality. Teacher evaluation and teacher shortage, I mentioned that. Finance ad adequacy, uh, building better K-16 uh, and other data links. And finally, the budget and accountability issue that you will be discussing this afternoon in a panel uh, where I think we need to go uh, much deeper. So with that, I will end. Uh, sorry, no time for questions. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I, um, I, I think I've told you about everything I know. So. <laughs>